Do you want to learn more on how to put money to work in regenerative food and agriculture? Follow our video course via investing in regenerativeagriculture.com slash course or in the links below. Now on to the podcast. You're going to listen to an interview with Rene Chan and we're going to talk about the challenges and opportunities on how to get institutional investors on board with regenerative agriculture. And also what's the role of high net worth individuals, foundations and family offices in this revolution. Enjoy! Welcome to another episode of Investing in Regenerative Agriculture, Investing as if the Planet Mattered, a podcast show where I talk to the pioneers in the regenerative food and agriculture space to learn more on how to put our money to work to regenerate soil, people, local communities and ecosystems while making an appropriate and fair return. Why my focus on soil and regeneration? Because so many of the pressing issues we face today have their roots in how we treat our land, grow our food and what we eat. And it's time that we as investors, big and small and consumers, start paying much more attention to the dirt slash soil underneath our feet. Before we get started, I've been recording these interviews next to my day job and I will definitely continue to do so and release about an episode a month. But at the same time, I would love to take this further, share more interviews. There are many more stories to share on investing in regenerative food and agriculture. More depth, improve the quality, maybe even doing some video series. So I started a Patreon community, which makes it easy to support creators like myself. If these podcasts have been of value to you, and if you have the means, I invite you to support me and make this happen. For more information, please find the link to my Patreon account in the description below. And now, without further ado, the interview. Enjoy! Welcome to Investing in Regenerative Agriculture, Investing as if the Planet Mattered. I'm Koen van Seyen, your host. And in the podcast of today, I'm joined by René Chan, founder of Pontera Partners, a natural capital investment specialist. She works with investors to identify and invest in sustainable, profit-generating environmental and real asset strategies to do the investment research, strategy analysis, but also the deal negotiations. We're going to have a lot to talk about, I think. Welcome, René. Thank you, Kun. So to start with, as I like to do, a personal question. How did you end up in regenerative agriculture and the investment side of things? kind of in a roundabout way, but also in a very, very fortunate way. Um, So my background um, is is in private equity. I've been doing that in both San Francisco and London for quite a few years. Um, But then deep inside my heart, my passion has always been um, conservation, environmental conservation. So about 2010, I basically decided that I will leave private equity, leave London and try to move to South America to start doing some environmental volunteering work. That was my goal. But when I moved down to Buenos Aires in Argentina, I ended up um, being introduced to a sustainable agriculture company that has a very long-term vision of what environmental sustainability should look like. They care a ton about conservation and wildlife and biodiversity. And they happened to need help um, um, looking at new investment opportunities. So um, they basically asked me to help them and that became they became my first client um, and I helped them analyze and evaluate investment opportunities that they wanted to look at. So um, in a way it has worked out really well because it allows me to combine my skill set in private equity investing with my passion for the environment. And through this first client, I started to learn more and more about agriculture. And then soon after that, I learned about regenerative agriculture. And so it kind of all kind of snowballs from there. Wow, that's a great coincidence that you met them there. And and how did the transition from, I'm not even a transition, but going from I'm focused on conservation to looking at agriculture, was it a gradual um, place or, or did it happen was there a specific moment where, where you saw how, how important agriculture could be for, for conservation? Yeah, um, well, when I was in finance, when I was in private equity, I was a generalist. I was looking at all sectors, um, in many ways, not conservation focused. Um, but For sure not. But during that time, um, I started looking at red carbon credits. Um, you know, reduction emissions for um, deforestation, land degradation. And I started looking at that and thinking that, well, potentially maybe that's something that I can shift my career towards, you know, to look at forestry carbon. But then the, the Copenhagen the Copenhagen conference in Tulsa at night, it didn't really turn out well. The U.S. didn't agree to to that. And so I realized, okay, maybe there's actually 
not a very sure future for forestry carbon, at least at that time. And then it was also by coincidence that I met the sustainable agriculture company. So I basically just shifted my focus towards agriculture. And that's when I realized, actually, the whole world needs to eat food regardless. There's a lot to do. There are a lot of issues, environmental issues surrounding modern agriculture. So I thought maybe this is what I should actually focus more of my time on. And the next few clients after that, they all became um, agriculture related opportunities. And so I just kind of gained my knowledge and um, can gain my knowledge and gain my interest that way. Um, and so now, even though Bonterra Partners looks at different types of natural capital investments, I would say agriculture is, is pretty much the, the most important bit of what I do, um, in addition to, say, fisheries and forestry etc. And if you look at agriculture and what you've seen in the past years in, in terms of regenerative agriculture, what, what's the most, what has been the most um, inspirational example you have seen, both maybe from an investor point of view or from uh, the agriculture or the agriculture company point of view? What was the one that uh, really, um, really stood out? I think I have seen the evolution and pickup of holistic management grazing of how, you know, just even, I would say, six, seven years ago, very, very few have heard of it, or those that have heard of it, they don't believe in it. Yeah, it's very hard to believe, it seems, for, for livestock farmers that, that there is another way possible. Exactly. And now in 2000, you know, starting 2000, I would say maybe 15 and after, you start hearing big NGOs talking about, yes, we can actually work with ranchers. We don't need to get rid of all the cattle and sheep. You know, we actually want to support them and work with them to figure out how to graze them in a sustainable, regenerative way by using intensive rotational grazing or holistic plant grazing, whatever you want to call it. So I think I have definitely seen the big change in that, which is very encouraging to me. Um, and then I think another thing that American farmers are looking more more and more at is now they're considering okay cover crops that's actually quite important so i i see that they are embracing that more and more and also no-till slowly um i think no-till is still generally like a pretty new concept in the us but the truth is in brazil and argentina for example they've been doing it for a long long time so it's um so it's, it's good for me to see that american farmers are kind of shifting to us that way as well and from an investor perspective, uh, what are the big changes you have seen there? From the investor side, especially from, say, high net worth individuals, family offices, you know, the more progressive type of investors, what I've seen is, say, from five or six years ago, they would, very few of them would have even considered investing in ag sustainable agriculture. Now, by now, I feel like they... They have heard of regenerative agriculture. They have now heard of holistic management. They have now heard of, uh, say, other things such as um, key line farming and incorporating multiple crops together on the same farm, um, mixed cropping and all that. So they are definitely warming up to the idea. And now some of them are saying, actually, we want to start investing in this sector because we understand how important it is. Um, so I think that's good. But that's actually at the at the more progressive type that only applies to the more progressive, smaller investors, I would say. So that with the institutional investors, you know, the large pension funds, university endowments, etc., um, they are still moving very slowly. Um, I don't think many of them are really looking at sustainable agriculture, let alone regenerative agriculture investments at this point. And, and for let's unpack both of them actually for these institutions, what are the biggest barriers for them? to get into this space? For the large institutional investors, you mean? Yeah, for the large ones, yeah. Yeah, yeah. The way they work is, you know, you try to pitch an idea to somebody on the investment team, but who makes the ultimate say is, of course, the investment committee. And in other cases, it could be the ultimate, the shareholders of the organization. And so for these people to convince the investment committees and their shareholders to invest in something, it needs to be something that's quite straightforward and simple and can be easily explained. A bit boring, basically. It has to be boring. It has to be boring or else the investment committee will not understand what it is. Um, hence, you know, with a lot of the um, large agricultural opportunities such as monoculture, GMO, corn soy rotation, or just um, investing in cattle that's being fed in a feedlot, all of those, are, they're actually quite easy to understand um, for the investment committee. So. 
it's much more is much easier for those investments to be approved than for you to try to present a regenerative agriculture opportunity to them and hoping that they will invest in it because regenerative agriculture and mother nature by itself is more complex. Regenerative agriculture investments or just practicing or implementing regenerative agriculture operations in, in general, they require a lot more thinking, they require more planning, and sometimes, depending on what it is, it could require a bit more labor. So all in all, you kind of add all these things up, it just becomes something that's not as easy to understand. It will be much harder, I would think, at this point, for someone from a pension fund to explain to the investment committee members why they should invest in a, say, mixed cropping farming business where you combine different permanent crops with some maybe annual grasses, annual crops, um, and how that's all going to mix together with, say, different livestock. So I think to them, it's just not simple enough, which is unfortunate because from my point of view, regenerative agriculture, the beauty of that is it actually mimics nature, which, like I said previously, is not that straightforward. It's, it's a bit more complex and it requires more adaptation and thinking and planning. And, and the role of these institutions, especially pension funds and insurance companies could be transformational in, in the sector because not only the because of the amount of, of capital they hold, but also because of the supposedly long-term view they should have because they, they're going to be there for a while. Exactly. Um, but yeah, they, they the systems and the processes internally have to probably catch up with, with what's happening um, in, in the impact space in general, but especially in agriculture. Yeah, and I think at the end of the day, for them, the ultimate goal and their primary fiduciary duty um, to their shareholders is actually financial return. And so um, I think the... It would be nice to have a living planet. <laughs> right, exactly. Um, I absolutely agree. You know, the shareholders should think about, you know, do I want there to be a planet for my grandchildren to live in? But um, maybe they don't think that far yet. Um, so, yeah, so basically I think for for regenerative agriculture investments, they basically see that as something that's very new, it hasn't been fully proven, and yet the financial return may just be similar to um, may just be similar to what they see from a, a conventional agriculture investment. So I think from their standpoint, they're like, ooh, the risk reward profile is not quite there yet. It's easier to to go for the, the ones you've already done and, and done before. Yeah. Or ones you have already seen, even though some of them may have failed in the past. Um, but at least they understand the risk. Okay, you know, if I plant GMO corn and soy, then my biggest risk would be, say, input cost and the climate. But then they don't question, will will there be skills? Will, that, will I have an issue hiring somebody to run a tractor down that farm? Um, I mean, those are not issues that they need to worry about. Um, but for regenerative agriculture, I think um, the skills and and the experience in the sector overall, that's just slowly building up. Um, so and I think that's another um, challenge for regenerative agriculture investment currently is it's hard for you to find, it's not that easy to find skilled operators out there who have done it for many years and who can run the farm in a regenerative way for you. They, they are around, but there are just not many. Yeah, I think it's actually one of the main challenges we have we don't have too many people that that can run that can really work the land well in a regenerative way at scale considering all the economic costs and, and everything involved it's a very very small group and and they they have many options to choose from so it's not that easy to get them to uh, to the one you want them to go to exactly i mean a lot of them they actually have their own farms and they're making quite a good profit so it's it is not their um, intention to go and raise a fund and work with investors they're they're, they're happy on their own farm so um yeah why would they yeah to go through all that trouble if their their farm is doing well and, and their their lifestyle you, of course they work incredibly hard they 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 can do what they love the most is which is working on the land exactly as opposed to having to pitch to investors who then ask you you know what, what is this about or, or you know what is the difference between a, a steer and a heifer and a cow um, things like that so yeah yeah we, we can't blame them actually to, to not do that yeah. <laughs> but we do need to do we do need them to do it so and and then do you see because I saw some some announcements and I read some reports on some larger funds being announced and especially one you have 
uh, been interacting with and also worked on, on a report with them, which is the Land Neutral Degradation Fund, and I'm probably mixing up the name now. Um, can you explain a bit what they're about? Because I, they are just launched, I think, two or three weeks ago, but they've been in the, the making for a while. Is this something that these institutional investors could grab and could get behind? Yeah, so the, the Land Degradation Neutrality Fund, the LDN Fund, um, is, um, I would say, is, is a partnership between Mirova, which is an impact investment firm that's um, based in Paris, um, together with the UNCCD, which is the United Nations Convention to Combat Desertification. Um, so the idea of the LDN Fund is, is an imp impact investment fund that is um, going to use a blended finance structure um, that will bring in both public and private money to invest in projects around the world that will restore um, or regenerate degraded land. Um, and so um, a lot of the projects that they're considering, for example, would be in the agriculture and forestry space, um, not just in developing countries, but also in, in developed countries. And the idea um, for them is to, um, for example, first bring in the public financing, whether it's from a DFI or government, they will, the public financing will take the most risky tranche of, um, of the structure. And then hopefully then with that, they can bring in some private impact investment money to take the, the less risky bit of the capital um, and use that to provide financing for projects around the world that, that shows the potential to, to restore degraded land. Which is a, a huge step for the sector, I think. Just, there hasn't been any blended capital or layered capital funds of this size, at least, um, at, at, that I have seen that are so focused on soil land degradation and, and agriculture. Yeah, exactly. And um, basically with the UN, one of their sustainable development goals is to restore, is to keep land at a neutral state, so restore degraded land. And they realize that relying on just public funding and philanthropy, that's not going to be sufficient. And so that's why they believe that they should try to come up with a, a blended finance vehicle that will try to, uh, that can try to bring in private capital um, without having without letting the private investors take on all the risks so that, you know, their DFI is willing to come in and take the more risky tranche, like I said, um, and use that to start to build up a vehicle. And this is the LDN Fund's ambition is not for this to be the only fund. They hope that this will just be fund one and then there will be other funds in the future. Um, because like you said, um, the amount of capital that's required to restore the amount of degraded land around the world and provide people with the sustain the livelihoods and provide food for people it's a lot of capital needs to go into that space many times this fund yes and is this these kind type of structures from your experience with with institutional investors that that maybe are looking at this space and are thinking and knowing that they have to become active and they want to become active but of course they have like we discussed the the structures and the processes inside to make it difficult are these type of structures, maybe not specifically this fund, and of course it's difficult to, to, to look into the heads of pension fund investors, but are these type of structures, the structures and the language that they speak more easily? So maybe this, this could mean more of, of the institutional money becomes available? I think the institutional money could be interested later on, say by say a fund three or fund four, after they have seen how the first one or two funds have performed. Um, because I think, um, as I mentioned earlier, for most of these pension funds, the financial return is still of primary concern to them. So I think um, if it's just a fund one or two, they may say, well, we don't quite know the track record of this yet. We don't even know if this concept of putting money through a blended structure into LDN type of projects is going to work. So let's wait and see. Um, and also the LDN fund, for example, and usually um, a lot of these blended finance structures um, usually are not aiming to deliver very high market rate return to investors. So unless I would say, unless an institutional investor actually has impact in mind or actually has an impact investment program in mind where they are willing or they are ready to accept slightly lower market rate returns because they want to support certain causes, I still think maybe this type of um, funds or vehicles um, probably 
won't be the type of investments that the, some of these large institutional investors will invest in until later on, or unless someone can come up with a fund structure that actually will allow these investors to receive a, a like stellar market rate return, then they'll be like, oh, it's no brainer. I can get my high return and at the same time be supporting impact. Which is, of course, the holy grail. So, yeah. But for you, the, the first, let's say the first few funds or these structures will be mainly invested probably by the progressive high net worth individuals, the, the larger family offices that that are maybe already comfortable with uh, at least understanding regenerative agriculture. If you look at this group and you've worked with them, um, what are for them the main challenges if you are um, a high net worth individual and, and you wanting to get into this space and wanting to put your, your money to work? Well, what would be the main challenges for for them? Mm, yeah. Um, well, I think in in addition to high net worths and family offices, I think foundations, for example, could be another possibility. So ah, yeah, of yeah. So thinking of of those three groups, um, the challenge I find often working with different family offices, high net worth individuals, foundations, etc., is they are sometimes almost too specific in terms of the type of causes they want to support. Um, the the example I like to give, for example, would be, no, not only do I want to support forestry, I want to support local redwood trees in my state. Um, that becomes very specific. Um, or um, an example could be like fisheries. Not only do I want to support fisheries, I want to support salmon and trout only and I, because I'm just not as interested in other uh, species. So I think with some of the investors, even though they're progressive, but if they have very specific causes they want to support, which is not a bad thing, then I think um, a fund such as the LDN fund that is going to invest worldwide because they do want to be diversified, they want to go into different sectors, um, different countries, um, then I think some of these investors may say, well, sorry, it sounds great, but it's, it's not going to be my cup of tea. Um, so I think that's one. The other thing would be a similar, a very common due diligence question that all investors would ask, which would be, um, can the LDN fund team, do they have the capability to execute? Um, given that this is a first fund, um, they're trying to invest worldwide, you know, in all sorts of sectors, do they have the knowledge and expertise to find the good deals, to negotiate good deals? Um, how are they going to evaluate and monitor the impact all of those questions, um, and but that's pretty typical. Whether you're investing in impact or not, um, you're basically asking, you know, the, about the management team's capability. And when you work with these, um, let's say, family offices, high net worth individuals, and foundations, as you've been doing for many years, what were some case studies of successful ones, and maybe if we can, also non-successful ones of of deals you looked at, some some. Uh, farms you looked at really things that stood out and that showed maybe the progress as well that we hopefully have made as a as a regenerative agriculture sector and where we stand now mm, yeah yeah looking at actually i i did some work for actually an impact investment fund um so not not a foundation or a um or high net worth but then um this impact investment fund that they have been very good at going up there to find good deals to invest in that are, uh, they invest in companies in, in Latin America, and basically they go for triple bottom line um, impact. And they have just been um, very good and disciplined in terms of doing that. And um, so for me, going being able to see that they were able to raise, to have not just a fund one, but also a fund two, and now you know, currently raising fund three, to me, that's, that's very encouraging. And you look at so um, some of the portfolio companies, what they have done, um, they are exactly the type of regenerative agriculture um, type of opportunities that we're talking about, and where they're working with smallholder farmers, and they are creating social impact, and they're delivering, you know, healthy food for consumers, etc. And so, um, so to me, that's that's success. But that actually requires um, my client, that impact investment fund, to have a local team based in Latin America and being out there current, constantly um, networking and sourcing deals and, and monitoring the, the investments. So that's um, one, one that I can think of that, it's, um, that has gone very well. Can you name the fund? Uh, yeah, yeah, I like them a lot, so I can actually name them. It's uh, Eco Enterprises Fund. I figured, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. 
So, so that's one example. And then um, I've done some work looking at um, Chile, for example, and you have interviewed Paul McMahon at SLM. And so um, together we looked at um, what can we do again in South America that will allow us to restore degraded land um, and at the same time do something that's that's profitable and scalable. And so um, so we were able to find a, an operator to help us lead that effort in Chile, which is great because, like I mentioned earlier, it's really hard to find good operators. And now currently SLM is fundraising for that. So um, I'm definitely hoping that um, fundraising will go well and that we can um, start doing something in Chile. Um, basically, they will be buying land in Chilean Patagonia and using holistic management grazing to produce, um, to do sheep production, producing both sustainable wool and sustainable lamb, uh, lamb meat. Um, so there's that. And then I can think of one case where um, I wouldn't call it a failure because my client did not make the investment in the end. But basically through the due diligence process, we realized that even though this investment could be something very good for the environment, um, for the financial return just wouldn't meet that criteria wouldn't meet the target that my client had. And in this case, is actually looking at um, reforestation of native hardwood species in um, Latin America. So um, it would basically require buying land and planting high value native hardwood species, such as say mahogany or Spanish cocobolo wood. It's is great for the environment and for my client, um, who I cannot name in this case, unfortunately, but they have a very, very long term view. So they're in actually, in a way, in no real hurry for any exit. Um, but basically, we after we did the due diligence by, you know, going into different countries to kind of talk to people who have been doing it for a while, we realized that it's very good for the environment. It's great for biodiversity. Um, however, the financial return is, is really not guaranteed because you know, growing a mahogany tree really takes 40, 50 years, and it's really hard to know whether it's actually going to grow well and have that type of production and yield that you're expecting. Um, and so I think even for my client in this case, who is definitely a patient, very patient investor, waiting 45 year, 40, 50 years and not knowing what the result would be, it just, it just doesn't make sense from a financial perspective. So in the end, we decided to not go ahead with this project. Um, so I think it's one of those where it is great. It can have great environmental and even social impact by creating jobs. But unfortunately, financially, I just don't think it's prudent to do so. Yeah, no, of course. And, and in terms of, let's say, for the next year or so, um, what do you see or what do you hope for? What, what do you see happening in this space uh, if we would talk in, in September uh, 2018? And what, what do you think we would be discussing um, in terms of regenerative agriculture and impact investing? Excellent question. Um, I think on one hand, regenerative agriculture, like I mentioned earlier, has gotten bigger in the last five years and more people know about it, which is great. But overall, it's, it's not your typical high tech deal where things move so quickly. So I think my view is probably in a year's time, if you and I would to sit down and have a chat again, we'll still be wondering how to bring in more capital into the regenerative agriculture investment space. I actually don't think too much is going to change between now and, and the next 12 months. I would be glad to be proven wrong. I'll be very happy if that's actually not the case. But looking at how some of the regenerative agriculture um, investments out there have been trying to fundraise and that they have been finding it challenging. Um, I actually don't see why things would be too different 12 months from now unless something happens to the economy or unless all of a sudden people realize that really the way that they have been doing modern day agriculture, say in the corn belt with your typical corn, soy, all of that all of a sudden has just gone down the drain in terms of in financial terms. I think that's when it will cause people to rethink, okay, now I really need to do something differently. That just did not work. So what should I consider? How about if I think about doing things in a more regenerative way so that I can minimize my costs and hopefully increase my profit? I think it will have to, something will have to happen on the financial side, on the on down, the bottom, the profit bottom line that will cause people to rethink. And I think with in regards to impact investors, I think um, what I would like to see slowly, maybe not within the next 12 months, but at least um, over the next few years is for people to really 
for impact investors to figure out what do they really want. Um, I think if you ask impact investors, a lot of them will tell you they want both the financial return and the impact. But if you really question further and ask deeper, what they really want is actually the financial return and that hopefully the impact will be there. Um, but I would just say and encourage them to just choose one. <laughs> you know, if you really want to go with a financial return, that is fine. But if you really want, if you really care about the impact, I think there are so many opportunities for you out there to back some of these um, emerging fund managers or emerging uh, companies, social environmental enterprises out there that is actually really trying to do something great, some, trying to do something that's regenerative. Um, give them a chance, you know, your financial return may not be great or you may have to wait for a long time. They may be able to create huge positive impact on society. So fund those people and there are plenty of those out there that require funding. Yeah, and I, I can see that also as field building and of course with part of your portfolio and, and but but be um, courageous there and maybe back once in a while something a bit less with a, with a smaller track record or which could create a huge a huge positive impact and, and might create um, and if everything goes well of course also a financial financial return would that be your your main advice if because of course everybody that's listening to to this podcast is already fully on board on regenerative agriculture and probably hopefully has sold all or exposure to to the corn belt and and to GMO soy and, and corn etc. What would be your advice to the impact investors that are ready to get into this space? Um, they they have maybe part of their portfolio available for this, maybe the full one. How how do you get exposure um, across the value chain basically to to regenerative agriculture? Where, where should I start looking? Mm, yeah. Um... I think it depends on the the amount of capital that one has available. Um, if one is um, if one is look more interested in making several small investments, then I think um, potentially there are some opportunities in the ag tech uh, agriculture technology space that could be interesting. Some of them are actually very focused on trying to help farmers with um, practicing regenerative agriculture or um, a better way to understand the soil, et cetera. So there are companies like that. Um, so, so I think that's one way to invest. Um, but if you're, say, a family office with quite, a, you know, with sizable amount of capital that's readily available to invest, consider some of the real asset opportunities, um, backing either, either doing it yourself or going through an investment fund that's trying to buy farmland and implement regenerative agriculture strategies. Back those people. There, there are some of them out there that that doing something that's very interesting. I think, and so, um, so that would be that would be one way to deploy the capital because obviously farmland is is expensive and um, it's hard for us to convince the institutional investors, like we said at this time, to put money into those opportunities. So, if you are a high net worth individual or a family office that's progressive, that's definitely the one space that um, I I would look at. Great. Thank you so much. I, I want to thank you for your time and we'll definitely be checking in, uh, let's say in a year from now and, and see uh, if you were wrong or right. Yeah, I, I hope I will be wrong actually. So yep, definitely we'll be happy to check in. Thank you, Kun. Thank you so much. You just listened to an interview with Rene Chan, founder of Bonterra Partners. We talked about the challenges of how to get more investment capital into the regenerative agriculture space. Thank you for making the time to listen to this podcast and making it all the way till the end. I hope you enjoyed it as much as I did. If you found the Investing in Regenerative Agriculture and Food podcast valuable, there are a few simple ways you can use to support it. Number one, rate and review the podcast on your podcast app. That's the best way for other listeners to find the podcast and it only takes a few seconds. Number two, share this podcast on social media or email it to your friends and colleagues. Number three, if this podcast has been of value to you and if you have the means, please join my Patreon community to help grow this platform and allow me to take it further. You can find all the details on patreon.com slash regenerative agriculture or in the description below. Thank you so much and see you at the next podcast.
Dear friends of the podcast, I'm super excited to share with you the online video course Investing in Regenerative Agriculture and Food. How to put money to work in regenerating soils at scale and growing a lot of tasty food while doing it. Why are we doing this course? After 100 interviews and more than 100 hours of audio asking the question how to put money to work in regenerating soils, and have been following the space since 2011 and recording this podcast since 2016, we thought it was time to share our lessons learned. What have we seen in the space over the last years? How have we built our decision-making framework? What to focus on with the podcast? How have we picked interviewees? And what questions should you ask? What is happening in the space? What should you read? What should you uh, listen? What should you watch? How to approach this space? For whom is this course? You, the soy builders and investors in this space. The soy builders, people working in this space, entrepreneurial farmers, fund managers, vehicle builders, crowd investing, platform builders, ag tech companies, farm to gut food companies, permaculture, key line designers, holistic management consultants, etc., etc. People that are building soil at scale and the investors who are putting their own money to work through their family office or as private individuals or people who are putting other people's money to work through foundations um, institutional capital banks insurance companies etc is this course free no this is pay what you think it's worth meaning i have no way of knowing what this course will be worth to you and i'm very aware that among the listeners of this podcast um, we have people with very different means so i'm inviting you if this course is creating value to you and if you have the means to consider paying what you think it's worth. Thank you. So what is this course? It's currently a series of 17 videos, mostly ranging from 10 to 15 minutes, plus PDF slides, so you don't have to write along. We're gonna look into why invest in regenerative agriculture and why extractive agriculture is so risky, how to invest, what kind of frameworks you could and I think should build, what to invest in, uh, what kind of co-investors you could find or what kind of investors you could find if you're a soil builder. Every lesson will have a digging deeper part where I will share what kind of reports, what kind of interviews, what kind of videos you can look into if you want to dig deeper. We're going to look at nutrient density, landscape design and a lot more. So what is it not? It's not a list of investable deals. Unfortunately, that doesn't exist in this world. We're really at the beginning of the regenerative agriculture and food revolution. It's also not investment advice. Before making any investment, please find professional investment advice. So get ready, get a cup of coffee, a cup of tea or whatever you're drinking. Click on the link below, sign up, and I'm really looking forward to your feedback.